Welcome and thank you for coming. My name is Con Hurley. I'm the director of the Center for Finance, Law, and Policy at Boston University. It's a new center set up to uh, run interdisciplinary programs and we've kind of expanded our mandate a little bit tonight by uh, leveraging off a, uh, a talk that was given here about a month ago. Uh, many of you from the faces in the audience were here when uh, Ambassador from uh, South Africa, Ibrahim Rasul, um, fascinated all of us talking about uh, the developments in South Africa as one, one of the BRICS countries, uh, a wonderful presentation that he gave. And he, he made passing reference uh, to South Africa as the gateway, uh, more than passing reference, as the gateway to sub-Saharan Africa, and, and also the role uh, that China investment uh, is playing in, in uh, Africa in general. And so this morning, as I was reading the newspaper, I was struck by uh, two articles uh, seeming to go in different directions on the issue of China in South A in uh, Africa. And uh, one is uh, a story about how Huawei, uh, a company, a Chinese company that happens to be the second largest telecommunications equipment manufacturer in the world, um, is making tremendous inroads in Africa, Kenya in particular is cited, where that company uh, has uh, achieved 45% uh, market share in the sale of its mobile phones in barely a year and a half by selling them at $100 when other mobile phones cost $700, $800. And so the article was uh, talking about how whereas the Chinese uh, entrepreneurs began competing in Africa against textile manufacturers, now they're competing in Africa against uh, uh, European and other Asian uh, manufacturers. Cautionary tale, uh, a tale of how uh, perhaps other countries, U.S. included, are missing the boat. But then you turn to the editorial page of the same newspaper and it talks about uh, Huawei's woes. And it tells a story there about the same company uh, has been uh, precluded by Australia from bidding on a $42 billion broadband infrastructure project uh, for the reason th that the ownership of the company is opaque. And there's concern, according to the editorial, that uh, military secrets and perhaps commercial secrets and personal privacy uh, will be compromised by uh, a company that is uh, of uncertain ownership. Uh, I'm just repeating what was read. I'm not endorsing it. <laughs> but these two developments uh, and what we are going to hear from uh, Johnny Meloto illustrate to me uh, the currency, the importance uh, of this issue. Uh, and and uh, I don't think it's overstating the case to say that if we, uh, we as a country, speaking from the U.S. standpoint, um, ignore this issue uh, much longer, our opportunity to be a, uh, a moving force will, will have been lost. So I'm, I'm honored and delighted that uh, Johnny Melodo, who is the deputy chief of mission, which means that he manages Ibrahim Razul in Washington as the ambassador. <laughs> I'm, told, I'm, not, I'm not speaking specifically, but I'm told that that's how that works in diplomatic circles. Um, we're delighted that he is uh, able to be here to take time out of his uh, busy schedule to talk to us about uh, Chinese involvement in Africa, what it means for Africa primarily, but uh, perhaps derivatively what it might mean for uh, uh, U.S. and other international uh, actors. He's been at the embassy in Washington since 2009 uh, for a period was the charge d'affaires um, and has a long uh, history despite his youthful appearance uh, in the government of South Africa. Uh, a father, a tutor, uh, a mentor, and uh, I for one am uh, looking forward tremendously to hearing his remarks this evening. Mr. Maloro. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hurley. Um, thanks for, uh, to the Center for Finance, Law, and uh, Policy for hosting this event, the African Studies Center, African Presidential Center, the Global Development Center, and the Purdue Center. 
uh, I'm quite honored to have been invited uh, uh, to follow closely on the footsteps of my ambassador. I see Mo is carrying his bags. <laughs> As you can see, he left this work behind for me to complete on, on the Africa-China relations. Um, uh, I'd just like to start with the proviso that in the same way that you mentioned the two contrasting stories about how Huawei seems to be doing quite well in Kenya, the African continent, and as you know, Kenya is amongst the fastest growing economies in East Africa, while at the same time the Australians prevented them from doing that, which is very interesting when you look at the most recent examples in 2007. Uh, uh, the uh, China uh, bank uh, bought a, a huge stake into our own standard bank of about five and a half billion uh, uh, dollars, which was the largest investments that the Chinese had made since our diplomatic relations in 1998. Uh, fast forward years later, you'll get the Walmart case in South Africa. And both of them were after the same stake, essentially, of South African companies that have made a name for themselves in the African continent and had a global, uh, uh, rather a continental uh, footprint. Standard, Standard Bank has about 26 uh, outlets in, in Africa and uh, Walmart, uh, Masmat, which uh, Walmart bought into, also has a similar presence in the continent. So you, you, you can see the types of, 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 of uh, contrasts and interesting challenges that you're facing with uh, the pr two most prominent powers in the world today. So um, I, I really, really, I haven't done China work in a while, but it's still a, a subject that is close to my heart. So uh, in preparing this, uh, I, I, I went back to prepare it lecture style, in a sense, mm -hmm. so that uh, 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 while I am a government official, to try to give a much more balanced approach rather than giving you a purely South African position, but just uh, put it purely on the basis of the factual situations as you find them and why the U.S. should be concerned about the Chinese foray into Africa. So any proposition uh, uh, to assess Africa as a monolithic and homogeneous bloc with a single and overarching foreign policy towards China will be doomed to fail. That's where we should start, that, you know, there's always this challenge of looking at Africa as this solid bloc of, you know, homogeneous countries which should be approached as a bloc and a lot of countries have done that, the U.S. Done it, that, uh, have done it, the Koreans, the Turkish, and what have you. But you will see the nuances uh, when it comes to how the Chinese have approached their relationship with uh, Africa. If you look at the history, that dates back from the 50s, when uh, Chinese first uh, established diplomatic relations, that is the People's Republic of China, established diplomatic relations with African nations. You'll see the stark contrast with how other countries, from a different perspective, have approached the relationship with Africa. And similarly, therefore, while China is rega regarded as this communist, one-party, monocratic state, uh, this misses the point completely about the current dynamism and the phenomenon that is China. You need to uh, go back beyond just the exterior appearances of what China and Africa constitute, then you'll start to understand this dynamic relationship. So the topic that I was given to address was the strategic implications of China's growing trading partnership with Africa, and I suppose its implications to the US if you continue in that vein. So a more useful approach rather would be to assess the various African states and their relationship with China as individual entities with divergent and, conver and convergent in interests. What is significant is that both African countries and China have realized earlier on what are the key opportunities to be derived from the various areas of convergence, which largely outstrips the difference to focus on the meaning of true and enduring partnership. In this regard, both African countries and China have each sought to devise coordinating mechanisms to facilitate their multilateral and bilateral relations. So there is that level at which they engage as a group through the, 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 the process that is FOCAC, which I'll come to later, as well as the relationships that are ongoing on a bilateral level. You will recall that there are still some countries that do not rec recognize the PRC. They recognize Taiwan, which is another interesting dynamic that adds some complexity into the relationship. While it's not possible in the sh within this short of time that we have to together to do justice to what is a very complex subject, I think the subject that I've been given on f of focusing on the growing trading partnership between China and Africa and the implications for the United States somewhat at least limits the field 
uh, but raises more concerns or questions. As you can imagine, as I stand here before you, I also represent the government of South Africa that has strategic partnerships be with, with both the United States and China. So where I come from, I have interest in preserving both and promoting both relations uh, equally so. And, and uh, that shouldn't be a contradiction because both countries represent e completely different interests. If you look at South Africa as a mining country or a country with a mining history, China is very much after commodities right now, which is what we can provide them. But uh, in terms of the US, our relationship is far much more sophisticated with us having a huge uh, manufacturing and financial services uh, relationship that uh, is at a much more sophisticated level than at which where we are currently with the Chinese relationship. So you can see the differences and the different opportunities and entry points from which we can come from. So from that right vantage point, uh, it is a case, a case that, could be, that could be made that there are indeed grounds for the United States to be concerned about the rise of China's influence, not only in Africa, but the world. This is not just our own assessment as a government or uh, my own assessment as a person, but based on scientific research and evidence. For example, concerns have been further raised at uh, fuel by assessments by institutions such as the International Monetary Fund, which has set a date for a moment when the age of America will end uh, and the United States economy overtaken by that of China. Furthermore, according to the latest IMF forecasts, China's economy will surpass that of America in real terms in 2016, a mere five years for, uh, a mere four years from now. What I will seek to do in this brief talk is to first depart from the premise that indeed the growing trade in partnership between Africa and China does pose some challenges to the United States. I also wish to point out that at the outset that we value both partnerships with China and the United States as each provide its own unique board benefits that we wish to leverage for our own development. So we hope that the United States will heed the message and respond through a comprehensive set of measures to ensure that it also takes up the opportunities that currently exist in Africa. I think to do justice to this exercise, I will start by contextualizing Africa and China in their domestic, regional, and global settings, how these have formed the backbone of the growing partnership, and to conclude with some implications for the United States and how uh, the US could respond to this. It will obviously be foolish to try and give a uniform assessment of all African countries as though they were the same, um, this would merely perpetuate stereotypes about the Afro-pessimistic tendencies that stubbornly refuse to go away. You know, where the failure of one country is attributed to others, the success of one would be regarded as a, an isolated incident that is soon to pass. I will also steer, uh, steer clear on being defensive and justifying uh, all that has gone wrong in Africa because a lot of work has gone into this and by now we know what Africa's shortcomings have been and what the reasons have been. I will limit my focus on the facts of the matter as it were and on my own analysis and implications. In his seminal work, um, Steve Ratlett, entitled uh, Emerging Africa, How 17 Countries in Africa Are Leading the Way, he argues that 17 emerging African countries are putting behind them conflict, stagnation, and dictatorships of the past. Since the mid-1990s, for 15 years, they have achieved steady economic growth, deepening democracy, Strong, stronger leadership, and falling poverty. He goes on to state, for too long, politicians, the media, academic researchers, and casual commentators have blended together all countries of sub-Saharan Africa, treating the countries of the region as a single entity and sometimes as a single country. His words are echoed, are echoed by those of the former governor of the Reserve Bank of Nigeria, Charles Soludo, who poses the question, when we talk about Africa, which Africa do we mean? Africa is just a geographic construct. We have to deconstruct the discussion and look at individual nations and their region if we are to get anywhere. What is puzzling though is that why after all of these observations have been made and institutions such as the World Bank, International Monetary Fund, World Economic Forum, United Nations Development Program regularly issue reports on each individual country's performance and global standing on a variety of socio-economic, developmental, and political issues, do we still continue to use this construct of assessing Africa? Why can't we see each country in its own merit, and why can't we reflect on the pros prospects and pro uh, positive progress that they are making? Notwithstanding these stereotypes, very few people can ignore the unprecedented rates at which Africa's economies have been growing. As other market stagnate, 
we know by now the, the, the global financial meltdown, how it's affected North America, how it's affected the European states. The emergence of Africa as the next frontier is becoming a, a more and more, pos a more and more impossible to ignore. Again, this is not mere conjecture, but based on scientific fact, and that is judged by uh, Africa by the same uh, that ju that has judged Africa by the same standards by which all countries are measured in terms of how they are progressing year on year. For example, according to a recent economic uh, inter uh, economist intelligence report, in the economist intelligence unit report says if we undertake a regional breakdown of Africa's economic growth in 2012, north, south, east, and west, growth is forecast to hit over 8 to 9 percent in some countries in the regions. In West Africa, for example, Nigeria and the oil-based economies will dominate the region. Ghana has also joined the club, the oil club in 2011 with its first commercial output. As you, you would know by now, Ghana is forecast to be the fastest growing economy in the world at 23 percent today. East Africa is forecast to be the fastest growing region, while in the south, South Africa is the country most exposed to the global economy. So it shows you the divergent economies that you have in the continent, that they're not all the same, and so therefore not to be painted with the same brush. We can go further and distinguish uh, uh, African countries according to their growth path, including their diversified economies, which are Africa's growth engines, the oil exporters whose growth could be enhanced through diversification, transition economies that could benefit from building on recent gains, and finally, pre-transition economies that still require to strengthen the basics. Perhaps no study is more instructive than the McKinsey reports that were released in 2010. Uh, here I'll quote from the Lions on the Move, the progress uh, and potential of African economies that was released in the summer of 2010. The report did a global comparison of Africa's positioning in 2008 and its expected standing in the next two to three decades. The study found that in 2008, Africa's collective GDP was $1.6 trillion, or roughly equal to that of Brazil's or Russia's. It is expected that by 2020, Africa's GDP will stand at $2.6 trillion. In 2008, consumer spending stood at a total of $860 billion. By 2012, 2020, it will be around $1.4 trillion. Now, these are very important figures, particularly if you look at the consumer base. As it increases, uh, that means the middle class continues to grow in Africa, a, a continent that now has a slightly above 1 billion population, which means it is a substantial market. And if countries such as the United States that continuously <coughs> seek markets are serious about their involvement in Africa, this is the time now to be in that market and cultivate those uh, uh, markets. So, for example, the more the country's GDP grows, the more it is able to invest, uh, invest in other enterprises and diversify the economy. And this, this has been borne out by fact. In our case, for example, you will see that over the years we have uh, moved away from being a purely mining-based economy to be a services-dominated economy as well as manufacturing-dominated economy. Manufacturing contributes about 31% of our economy. Uh, services contribute to about 63%. Uh, uh, mining has gone down to about 2.5%, and agriculture is also occupying a similar figure. So it, it just shows you how it, it, it is possible uh, if you are a country that is minerals de de dominated to diversify if you use your resources effectively. Now, these developments on the African continent have not, gone, uh, has not, have not been lost on other countries, especially China, that has since around 2000 made concerted efforts to capitalize on d decades of political solidarity to form a strategic partnership with Africa through the Forum for China-Africa Cooperation. This is not to say that the relationship itself started in 2000. As I indicated, the Chinese first got involved uh, through formal diplomatic relations in the 50s when you had a, sta a spate of independence in, uh, uh, in, in, in African countries. FOCAC, as the Forum for China-Africa Cooperation is called for short, is a creative mechanism that recognizes the usefulness of providing an overarching coordination mechanism at the multilateral level while allowing for flexibility for implementation to occur at a normal bilateral level. China's involvement in Africa is quite an interesting uh, case study for a country that has for years preferred to play a low profile in global affairs. You'll recall Deng Xiaoping's uh, famous uh, uh, dictum hide brightness and cherish, ob ob cherish obscurity. This was largely premised uh, on the Chinese preoccupation with domestic economic growth and political stability. 
This preoccupation stems largely from the political organization within China centered on the Communist Party of China, or the CPC. The CPC insists that persist in upholding, uh, insist that China should persist in upholding state-controlled single ideology against ideological pluralism, stick with state-controlled capitalism rather than compete, uh, complete free market capitalism, maintain fundamental economic control rather than total privatization, and hold the system of cooperation between patriotic parties and as consultative bodies to CPC rather than having the Western-style multi-party uh, system. But if you look at where China has come from, uh, these principles no longer hold that true. China has been very dynamic in the sense, if you look at the recent reports, for example, with the sacking of Bo Xilai, who was a, a very prominent figure from Chongqing within uh, 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 the, the, the Chinese power brokers, it starts to tell you how prepared the Chinese establishment itself is prepared to clean itself of issues such as corruption where party structures are abused to perpetuate uh, the pre overall dominance of the Communist Party of China. And not only that, the approach that I've stated ab 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 above has changed with so many, time, uh, so many times over and chi China has been drawn into playing a more active role uh, in international affairs. And so too has this uh, led to a need for China to adjust and uh, align our, uh, itself with international norms. As Elizabeth Economy uh, argues, China's leaders once tried to insulate themselves from greater engagement with the outside world. They now realize that fulfilling their domestic needs demands a more activist global strategy. Without delving uh, into a deep history lesson, it is possible to assess the evolution of the Chinese domestic and foreign policy through various leadership generations to demonstrate this transition. I think this is important if you could indulge me a bit here. If you look at the first generation of Chinese leaders, uh, from 1949 to 1976 uh, with Mao Zedong as the core. They tended to be both military and political leaders and were guided by Marxism and Mao Zedong thought. The second generation from 1976 to 1992 with Deng Xiaoping as the core tend to a focus from cl class struggle and political movement to economic development, pioneering Chinese economic reform. The third generation from 1992 to 2003 with uh, Jiang Zemin as the core was guided by the ideology of Zemin's three represents, the represents in capital R, which were captured in his address to the 16th Communist Party Congress, where he stated that, reviewing the course of struggle and the basic experience over the past eight years and looking ahead to the arduous task and bright future in the new century, our party should continue to stand in the forefront of the times and lead people in marching toward victory. In a word, the party must always represent the requirements of the development of China, China's advanced productive forces, the reorientation and development of China's advanced culture, and the fundamental interest of the overwhelming majority of the people of China. So in a sense, you started to have a people-centered uh, 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 approach towards global affairs, as well as looking at using your productive forces more effectively, but also embedding this very much in Chinese culture. The fourth generation from 2003, and likely to change this year uh, during the 18th uh, Communist Party Congress, includes Hu Jintao as their core and features prominent leaders such as Wu Banguo, Wen Jiabao, Jia Xingling, Zheng Jinchong, and Wu Yi. The dominant ideology of this generation is premised on Hu Jintao's scientific development concept, striving for the goal of a harmonious society. This entails sustainable development, social welfare, a people-centered society, increased democracy, harmonious society. This inwardly looking ideology belies a very activist foreign policy agenda that could be traced back to the third generation of leadership under Jiang Zemin who launched the country's first go-out policy and encouraging the country, the country's state-owned enterprise to go abroad in search of natural resources. As a result of Jiang's initiative, China's trade resource with, re China's trade with resource-rich countries of Southeast Asia, Latin America, and Africa exploded between 2001 and 2007, growing by 600%. This is historical transition over the generations demonstrate how well China's foreign policy agenda was carved, was carved out of a response of bo to both domestic push and external pull factors. With its going out, China has found uh, itself deeply embedded 
in global econo in the global economy and geopolitical system, and neither wants or can retreat unto itself given the attention it has generated. Turning to the Africa-China trade partnership, after almost a decade of pursuing an active foreign policy of uh, seeking natural resources for its rapidly economic gro uh, growing economy and population, China finally convened the Forum for China-Africa Cooperation in Beijing in 2000. The forum was held at the ministerial level and is alternatively held every three years between China and an African country. I attended one myself in uh, Egypt that was held in, Sh in, 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 in Cairo. Uh, those are very fascinating meetings. FOCAC follows in the footsteps of other similar forums such as uh, the Tokyo International Conference on, for African Development that China has with Japan. An interesting observation of FOCAC, though, is its political foundation and economic outlook. The Chinese have understood from the beginning that forging political and genuine ties with the new partners were quite essential to, for the socio-economic aspects of the partnership to work. For example, of the 10-point Beijing Declaration of 2000, the first point invokes the purposes and principles of the Organization for African Unity and the Charter of the African Unity, as well as the Chinese five principles of Chinese co of peaceful coexistence. Now, for those of you who would know that uh, at the stage that FOCAC was done in 2000, it was before the onset of the African Union, which was only launched in 2002 as South Af in South Africa with us as the first chairpersons of the African Union. So already the ground was laid for a very significant partnership between China and Africa. The declaration then goes on to address issues that are very critical and sensitive for the Chinese to clear the air, as it were. These include the question of human rights. Here, point four of the declaration states that the universality of human rights and fundamental freedom should be respected and the diversity of the world and the principle of seeking common ground while reserving differences must be respected. Each country has the right to choose in, its, in the course of its development its own social system, developmental model, and way of life in light of its national conditions. Countries that vary from one another in social system, stages of development, historical and cultural background and values have the right to choose their own approaches and models in promoting and protecting human rights in their own countries. Moreover, the politicization of human rights and the imposition of human rights conditionalities on economic assistance should be vigorously opposed as they constitute a violation of human rights. The declaration concludes with the intention to vigorously promote further China-Africa cooperation in the economic trade, financial, agriculture, medical, care, and public health. Uh, it goes on you know, to deal with all those issues that relate to socioeconomic development. But what is instructive, though, is that this declaration received buy-in buy, buy from all the partners that, were, uh, pa that participated in the first FOCAC forum. And China was able to clearly exclude the issue of discussion of, on its human rights record from the word go, so that it clears the air uh, uh, that we both respect the African way of doing things through the Organization for Africa unit, Unity, as well as the ideals for which they stand, and introduce the five principles of peaceful coexistence. So these three points are very important and instructive to the relations that the relation that was formally forged in 2000, as they set the parameters as well as the tone for the relationship. Any effort to understand the relationship between China and Africa would fall short if, does, if it does not unpack the FOCAC framework. Not only does the framework provide for clear objectives, it has also been able to deliver against the stated objectives. An interesting observation is that once the ground rules were agreed to in 2000, the partners got underway with the business of delivering on the framework. Although there have been some consent by African countries in the earlier years of FOCAC that assessments were largely done by the Chinese side without an opportunity for, Af for the African side to do their own reports, successive re reports reveal that a lot of incremental progress has been made over the years. It is interesting also to note that the focus of the partnership and recorded progress have been mainly in what was the last point in the 2000 declaration, namely socio-economic cooperation and economic development. So the shift was completely away from the political preoccupation and focused mainly on what uh, the Chinese could deliver to this partnership. And what is interesting is that 
for the longest time there was a question around Chinese reporting and Chinese statistics in terms of trade figures as well as the investment that was actually transferred to the continent until the continent itself through its sub-regional organizations decided that they will do their own research as well as their own reporting uh, instead of doing it on a bilateral level and report in a coordinated fashion. Once you started having that, those reports were then introduced in a formal uh, uh, plenary where they could be tabled and agreed to by both sides. So as it were, to compare figures. The following successes could be noted in the 12 years that FOCAC has existed. By 2003, during the second FOCAC ministerial, the forum noted that Chinese li leaders visited on 20 occasions, and China received more than 30 presidents, vice presidents, ministers, and parliamentary leaders from African countries. On the economic front, the Chinese government reported that it had made good on its promise by completing ahead of schedule the reduction of African debts. By June 2002, China had signed debt exemption protocols with 31 countries, African countries, canceling 156 debts with a total value of 10 billion renminbis. The total trade volume increased, uh, uh, the total trade volume reached $18.5 billion in 2003, increasing by 49.7% over the previous year and by approximately 75% approximately over the year 2000. Exports from China, export to China from African countries grew substantially, resulting in a steady dwindling in their deficit with China. In the same year, 2003, China reported that it, it signed bilateral investment protection agreements with more than 20 African countries and set up a China Trade and Investment Promotion Center uh, in about 11 countries. 117 new Chinese invest, invested in enterprises were established in Africa. The political solidarity between the partners also continued to grow and in observance of the 50th anniversary of the inauguration of diplomatic relations with Africa, a summit at presidential level was convened in 2006 where the presidents who attended there declared that we hold that the adherence to ch of China, the world's largest developing country, to peaceful development and the commitment to Africa, a continent with the largest number of developing countries to stability, development, and renaissance are in themselves significant contributions to world peace and development. The African countries are greatly inspired by Chinese rapid economic development. They extend congratulations to China and wish China great, even greater achievements in its development. They reiterate that they adhere to the One China policy and support Chinese peaceful re reuni re reunification. These two messages are very instructive uh, uh, that come from this declaration. The one relates uh, to the strong uh, association of China with the developing world, which has served China quite well in multilateral forums because it can always count on all the 54 votes of the African countries based on its uh, planting its feet firmly onto the developing world side and associating itself with the developing world. The second is the commitment to adhere to the One China policy. As you know, that it continues to bedevil the Chinese leadership. Uh, the issue of Tibet and Taiwan constantly emerges, and the Chinese uh, vociferously defend themselves uh, against uh, any interference in its domestic affairs. So the second commitment to adhere to the One China policy is, con is consistent with both international law uh, those of you who are in the area of international law, the Chinese elder, all, often defend it as being consistent with both international law, which recognizes the principle of the People's Republic of China as the sole and legitimate uh, representative of all Chinese people. By the third FOCAC ministerial in 2009, the Chinese government reported that noting the importance on facilitating investment expansion in Africa, decided to support related Chinese banks in setting up a China-Africa Development Fund, whose total, uh, total amount will gradually reach around $5 billion to give encouragement and support to well-established and reputable Chinese companies in making investment projects in Africa, which will contribute to local technological progress, employment opportunities, and sustainable economic development. China pledged to further open up its market to Africa, increase from 190 to about 440, the number of export items to China eligible for zero tariff treatment to the least developed countries in Africa having diplomatic relations with Africa and launch bilateral negotiations with countries that are concerned for the early conclusion and implementation of these agreements. In 2011, China became Africa's, Africa's largest trading partner. 
which uh, with with trade of around 160 billion dollars and will continue to boost ties with african countries increasing trade and investment and cooperation trade rose from 129 billion dollars in two, 2010 to 106 billion dollars uh, in in the past year making china the biggest trading partner in africa I mean, $160 billion is, is hardly anything, you know, uh, for a continent such as Africa. And uh, it should be very worrying that the U.S. Uh, could not even ma match such a, a small figure in terms of trade with, with the continent. We probably push f a, a far bigger trade ourselves within the continent than $160 billion as South Africa. So this is something to, to, to seriously think about. As you can appreciate, the successful partnership between Africa and China owes to a large measure to the establishment of a solid foundation premised on solid, uh, political solidarity and the commitment to win-win solutions. China has firmly, firmly planted its feet and tied its destiny to that of the developing world, thus leveraging on the political solidarity and trust by its African counterparts that it is truly seeking win-win solutions. It is important to also note that China that while China is indeed growing a very, uh, at a very rapid rate and likely to surpass the United States' economic de dominance by 2016, it still shares with Africa a lot of the developmental cha challenges that come with developing country syndrome. The skyrocketing rates of pollution and env environmental degradation, rampant corruption, soaring unemployment, reports uh, around employment range from anything from 9.4% to 20%. Social, the social uh, uh, welfare net is in tatters, and there are rising in income inequalities, in inequalities. Together, these social ills contribute to over 100,000 protests annually in China. It is therefore clear that the same argument that Steve Redlett makes with regards to, to what we have been, uh, the five fundamental <coughs> changes that have led to a turn around in African emerging countries would also probably be applicable in the case of China. These are the rise of more democratic and accountable governments. China has spoken about uh, its path towards democratization. This would be an issue that still stands to be seen. The introduction of more sensi uh, sensible economic policies, the end of the debt crisis and changing relationship with the international community, clearly this applies mostly to the African countries that have managed to use the, the resources that have been freed up by debt to be able to invest in their own economic development. The spread of new technologies, uh, you've just spoken about the Huawei deal, that uh, 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 market penetration for the cel cel cellular phone industry is very big in, in, in Africa. MTN, which is a South African firm, does quite well in that market and is a market leader in the continent. The emergence of a new generation of public and private leaders. So these are all the five factors that are quite critical in terms of uh, how well China can sustain the growth that it currently has. <coughs> to ensure the continued success of both African countries and China, as well as both within the partnership, it is important that these fundamental changes are sustained. Otherwise, the promise of these countries will remain just that, a promise. It is important, however, that opportunities and promise are, are, are not left at that stage, but acted upon. And a lot will depend on the sustained progress made by African countries and whether China, China's economy and influence in the world also continues to grow. Now, turning to the implications for this partnership with regards to the United States, I will depart from the premise that one of the biggest advantages that the United States has in partnership with Africa today is the fact that it remains the only superpower. And on the strength of that alone cannot be ignored. Another advantage is that is the partnership between Africa and the United States through the Africa Growth and Opportunities Act. ACOA, for short, was enacted by the United States Congress uh, and signed by President Bill Clinton into law in May 2000. So it was inaugurated in the same year as the FOCAC Forum was uh, inaugurated. Uh, it was uh, signed by Bill Clinton into law as a component of the Trade and Development Act of 2000. The act seeks to enhance trade and investment between the United States and Africa by providing for one-way trade preferences to products originating from the sub-Saharan sub sub African countries. The act authorizes the U.S. president to designate countries as eligible to receive the benefits of AGOA-based and continuous efforts to establish market economies. Now, this is very important that the act gives the president the power to designate 
which countries will be beneficiaries. When you contrast that with FOCAC, you get a different picture altogether that all countries, regardless of their status, are members of FOCAC without fail. So already you're starting from a very uh, a negative pr perspective where the U.S. can designate which country deserves to, to partner with it in terms of trade. So that's one of the uh, 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 regulations. So the rule of law and political plur pluralism, elimination of barriers to U.S. trade and investment, protection of intellectual property, efforts to combat corruption, policies to reduce poverty, increasing the availability of health care are just among some of the issues that a country must, uh, 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 some of the criteria that a country must meet in order for it to be a beneficiary. At the moment, there are about 31 uh, uh, ACOA beneficiaries, and we are number three in terms of the most influential trading partners on that list. The first two are Nigeria and Angola, but they are single commodity traders, oil traders. So South Africa is the most diversified of the trade, of, 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 of the three top countries that are trading with the U.S. But by all assessments, all agree that ACOA is a very good platform through which uh, the United States and Africa uh, conduct their relationship. So ACOA expands the list of products which eligible sub-Saharan countries may export to the United States subject to zero import duty under the generalized system of preferences. Now, just to give you a sense, under the, um, the, the, the FOCAC, you have about 490 product lines that can be exempted from tariffs. ACOA provides uh, around 6,400 product lines and covers 4,600 items. So there are huge opportunities in terms of what it is uh, that the United States affords Africa to, uh, to, to be able to grow its trade relative to what China affords. The only difficulty is that in most of these product lines, Africa has very little ability to meet those quotas. Africa is bedeviled by supply side constraints, which in the FOCAC situation, the Chinese are really trying their best to assist by going in onto the ground and investing and assisting small firms and SMEs to be able to develop the capacity to be able to produce and export. So there's a huge opportunities, uh, opportunity that is being missed there. The Africa Investment Incentive of 2006, signed by President Bush on 20 December 2006, further amended portions of the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act and is referred to as ACOA 4. The legislation extended the third country fabric provision for an additional five years. Now, the third country fabric, uh, fabric provision provides the opportunity for countries in Africa to source products or fabrics from third countries and still be able to retain their preferential access to the United States. But the challenge that we're facing now is that there's a lot of uncertainty around AGOA. It expires in 2015, and yet there is no guarantee or indication from the side of, U of the US as to whether it will be extended. The major challenge is around the third country fabric provision with, uh, which expires this year in September. And already there have been a number of major contracts that have been uh, canceled by US uh, buyers due to the fact that there has been no certainty that those prices will be guaranteed. You normally need guarantees a year in, uh, in advance. So all this tentativeness is not endearing the US at all to its partners. It's creating some instability in the African markets and the economies that are largely dependent on these markets are likely to take severe hits. So that is uh, one of the problems that uh, 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 the ACOA uh, Act is facing right now. Just like FOCAC, ACOA has received positive reviews from African beneficiary countries who have benefited a lot from the partnership. For example, ACOA has had a positive um, uh, impact on South Africa's import, uh, exports, particularly exports in motor vehicle, uh, ve uh, vehicles, minerals and metals, agro-processed foods. In the area of motor vehicles, uh, as you would know, we actually export the C-class Mercedes-Benz to this market. It is uh, fully made in, in, in South Africa, and it uh, benefits uh, the whole notion of regional integration in the sense that we get our leather from Botswana, and we get the rubber that makes the tires for the, 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 the C-class Mercedes-Benz from the DRC. So as you can see, there are a lot of opportunities and integration of markets that come out of our partnership with the United States. So, and uh, in the area of agro-processed foods, of course, one of our best agro-processed uh, food that we export is our wine. 
that does very well in this market and we hope to continue to do so. South Africa is the number one destination for U.S. exports to Africa, saw a 17.6 rise uh, in U.S. in exports uh, in 2008, although there was a decline in 2009 as a result of the global economic turn down. U.S. imports from South Africa grew by 9.9% in the same year with a decline in 2009. Trade figures for 2010 and 11 show a recovery in overall South African U.S. trade. Supply-side constraints remain a primary challenge hampering the effective integration of Africa's economies into the global system. These countries that have been, those countries that have been able to take advantage of AGOA preferences are those countries that already have high, a high standard of infrastructure, that is roads, ports, rail, power, water supply, and telephone services. An equally important variable is the availability and quality of the labor force, which is indicative of uh, the existence of a formal economy. Funct functional institutions which can serve to inform their private sector and of global trade opportunities are also necessary. Expanding investments and capacity building initiatives would ameliorate these challenges. The strengthening of regional economic communities and commitment to regional integration through the creation of physical infrastructure, infrastructure and policy harmonization is a necessary process to sustainable <coughs> development. Now, President Obama in 2009 or 10 published uh, the new export initiative, which speaks to the whole notion of how you create capacities to address supply side const constraints. But that is largely focused on American SMEs for them to export to Africa. As I indicated earlier on, for the African market to be able to absorb the products that will be produced by those SMEs, you need to have a strong middle class that has the income to be able to consume those pro products. So a better approach for the U.S. would be not just to look at the U.S. side, but look at joint ventures between African and American uh, uh, SME, SMEs to develop those capacity-related uh, uh, issues so that you deal with the supply side constraint, constraints. What I have sought to give here is a broad exposition of what uh, uh, has uh, 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 accounted for this enduring and dynamic partnership between Africa and China. I did not expect that African nations should mimic the Chinese or, for that matter, the American growth and development models. They need to find their own models based on their own unique circumstances. At the same time, as more African economies get integrated into the global economy, it is clear that they require to develop strategic premise, uh, partnership premised on win-win solutions so that they can sustain the gains that they have currently realized. Both FOCAC and AGOA were founded in the same year and the results are, are there for all to see. If these are anything to go by, it is clear that China, is current, current, China currently has a slight edge, uh, and if the United States must remain relevant as a strategic partner in Africa, it needs to demonstrate this through action by extending AGOA and improving first its understanding of Africa, thereafter its footprint through, the direct, through direct investment. On the other hand, Elizabeth Economy contends that if the United States want to retain its preeminence pre or at least maintain its role in shaping norms and values that will guide the world in the 21st century, its China policy cannot be merely a reaction to Beijing's initiatives. It must be part of a broader, long-term global strategy that begins with a clear assertion of United States domestic priorities. FOCAC is open to all African countries and has even managed to transcend the tricky issue of Morocco, which is not an African Union member. On the other hand, AGOA is restrictive and, and beneficiary status is premised on a designation by the U.S. president based on a, a, a number of criteria. These criteria are what the Chinese regard as conditionalities. Both FOCAC and AGOA have suffered from the same criticisms that the assessments are one-sided. The good thing about the Chinese side is that they have been prepared to be transparent and all communiques of all meetings are public. Therefore, bind the parties to concrete deliverables and countries can now do their own assessments. The United States may also wish to consider such an approach for Agua forums. I would like to conclude this address with a little story about an African-American's perspective about why or about what is wrong in the United, with the United States approach to Africa today. In his book entitled, Why African-Americans Fear Doing Business in Nigeria, Gerald Walker contends, as I watched the media portray Nigeria and Africa throughout my life, I couldn't help but think that most of the countries 
up there are poor with animals running around everywhere. The truth is that Nigeria is just like America in the late 1960s and early 70s, a time when I saw African Americans trading with each other and a time when our economy was not fully developed economically. Walker goes on to tell a story of how about, of how in the first, uh, the first time he went to Nigeria with a Nigerian friend, uh, the challenges and opportunities in encount he encountered and the frustrations he had to deal with to secure capital from American lending institutions. I quote, we spent about 40 days on our first trip and we probably met with more than 50 businesses. And believe it or not, we didn't have one business telling us no, that they didn't need our products, if only we had the products to sell. When we started looking for capital, I began to see with my own eyes how people in the U.S. view Nigeria. Even when I received my second contract, which was for more than $1.1 million in the form of a guaranteed irre irrevocable letter of credit, no bank would accommodate us because the letter of credit was from a Nigerian bank. This is where I end my talk. And thank you very much. I'll take, I'll take questions. Questions, and I just want to ask that as you make your questions, you speak into the microphone. Is there someone with the microphone here on either side? Uh, because this event is being uh, recorded for uh, posting on our website. So please. Thank you. Go ahead, Tim. Yes. Hi. Uh, Tim Longman, the director of the African Studies Center here. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about. Um, the either reality or potential of South Africa and China being competitors within Africa. Because uh, it strikes me that, that both South Africa and China kind of entered Africa <clears throat> at the same time. Yeah. Um, when I first started doing research in East and Central Africa in the early 1990s, um, there were boycotts on South African products. Uh -huh. But now when you go to Rwanda or Kenya or elsewhere, you, know, you find South African wines and apples and, and a number of other things. Um, in the early 1990s, there were products that were Chinese, but they came mostly through Dubai, mm -hmm. and there weren't many actual Chinese business people there. Um, <clears throat> and so it strikes me that both China and South Africa are viewing the rest of the continent as a place to sell their products. Um, but it also strikes me that both China and South Africa are interested in extracting resources from the rest of the continent. Certainly there are South African companies involved in the DRC uh, and elsewhere looking for uh, resources in addition to what South Africa already has. So I'm, I'm wondering if you could address whether that's China and South Africa will continue to get along really well or whether there's a potential for um, some division. Okay. No, thank you. I think that is a very valid question and a, a, a pertinent one in, in the strategic relationship we have with China. Um, our relationship with China, formally, uh, we've always recognized Taiwan. We did recognize Taiwan in 1997, and in 98, we formally started the process of uh, recognizing China. Uh, so our relationship dates that long. Uh, but it's premised on a very fundamental principle of uh, mutual respect and win-win uh, partnerships. And from the word go, there was always an understanding that partnership does not mean that there won't be areas that we don't compete. And it is likely that we'll also be competitors. And that is also written into our partnership for growth and development. China and South Africa have a, a partnership for growth and development. That clearly spells out some of those challenges that you're talking about. But if you look at the way in which South African and Chinese uh, companies operate, it's quite different, cheese and chalk. Uh, our government puts very strict requirements on how companies ought to conduct themselves. We have what is called the King Report on Corporate Governance that governs how South African corporates govern. And if a South African company is held to certain standards, those standards continue to apply for, to them even as they work uh, outside the country. So we hold them to those countries. So whatever it is that they do, they have to follow uh, domestic legislation. That's why we even have uh, anti mercenary legislation that deals with people who go to earn a living through means that would be illegal in the country. They will still be prosecuted. So our companies, I know uh, uh, in the DRC in particular, there was some, some serious controversy about uh, South African companies mining there using child, child labor, li labor, and those companies were sanctioned actually. So South Africa holds our companies to those standards. In the past, there were some challenges in countries in East Africa where our companies were boycotted, 
uh, because they dominated local businesses where people would come whenever we made sales and procure things from our shops and resell them, repackage them and resell them at far higher values. But those are things that are starting to change because we depart from the premise that uh, ours is not to go and loot Africa. It's to create capacity in Africa. We pursue an altruistic foreign policy where we put resource in, resources in other countries without necessarily the prospect of wanting anything in return. Uh, we've had incidences, for example, where we provided a lot of capacity in the De Democratic Republic of Congo uh, after the demise of the former uh, uh, Kabila Senior, uh, where we had about 21 government departments from South Africa that went there to assist from anything from censors to setting up the public se se uh, 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 sector to ensuring that you had systems working. So for us, it's if we see Africa prosperous, it is a good thing enough for us, to, for those economies to be able to sustain themselves. And the a Chinese approach is a completely different one, that uh, each and every country will negotiate its own deals. And we respect that, because similarly in our situation, when we engage with the Chinese, we would get the best deal there is, hence a win-win solution. If we feel we've extracted the most benefit from such a uh, transaction, then that is what we'll go by. But I think what is common to both our approach uh, both ourselves and China into Africa is the approach of seeking relationships before transactions. It is, very, it is a very important approach because it means that you are committed to the ideals of the development of that country rather than just wanting to make a quick transition and be out of there. So it all depends ultimately to each individual sovereign state to make its own decision about what it is, is its uh, development destiny and whether it can extract it from uh, uh, whatever deal it has negotiated. Uh, I have you, lady, then I'll take your question, then I have you. Hello, yes. my name is Karen Charles. I'm a master's student at MIT, and I'm also a development researcher for the Prince Edward's Fellowship. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. My first question has to do with um, the role of Chinese employees in Africa. A lot of the literature tends to indicate that when China comes in, they bring a lot of Chinese employees. So I'm wondering if that's your experience, and if yes, how has South Africa dealt with the issue? And my second question has to do with security. I know America has established AFRICOM, mm -hmm. which kind of deals with this. I don't know how much they interact with South Africa, but does China have anything similar? Do they have any kind of um, security program or measure that would inter that would come into Africa if need be. Mm. Thank you. Okay. No, thank you very much for those questions. Um, on the issue of Chinese laborers, uh, laborers uh, you know, um, for the longest time that I've worked uh, uh, on this matter, you've had the so-called 70-30 principle, where when you've struck a, struck a deal, you would get 30% uh, uh, of what the Chinese will deliver if they invest in a pro in a, in a, in a, in a project. But what you would get with that, you will get the labor that comes with it, and you will just get the product delivered with you without using any local labor. And um, we've dealt with a number of some of those sensitive cases uh, 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 where you've had uh, a project signed, the next day you have a whole consignment of Chinese laborers already on the ground waiting for working permits. And unfortunately, we believe in the rule of law, which is one of the things that we always encourage and we always pride ourselves in that the rule of law is very important, that institutions and, 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 and a very predictable legal framework makes for good business partners. And there is no way you can have, because if people come in that way and have no proper working documents, they are illegal immigrants, so they will be deported from the country. So it's as simple as that. So that is why I say it depends on each individual sovereign state how you negotiate the deal. For us, what is important is that in every deal, it's a, it's a law, unfortunately we can't do much about it. It is the law for any investor from anywhere in the world. We are a country, a country that is currently strapped of skills. So any project that we discuss, that we negotiate, it must transfer skills to South Africans. So you must have South Africans in that. And we do the same even, uh, going back to the question that you asked, we do the same even for our companies. We do not allow our companies when they invest abroad to have the management structure stay purely South African. The management structure must be representative of what the laws of that country are, and it must be representative of locals. We do the same even in this market. 
in this market, we have huge investments. We have investments in Alaska, in, in, mine, in copper mining of about $15.5 billion. We have investments in uh, Louisiana. We're doing some huge gas explorations. And even then, Miller yep, Miller is run, is purely American run. It is a 100% South African company. But the management structure here is still American. So we insist on those requirements that there must be some form of skills transfer and that once the, 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 the people who do the project leave, it will be run by South Africans. Then on the one around military arrangements, we don't do that much in terms of uh, military cooperation. We do have some trade with uh, uh, the, the Chinese. Uh, we have some limited uh, joint exercises that we do, uh, but we really don't do that much. In fact, this market and the Europeans, those are our traditional markets in terms of uh, military wear. We ourselves, of course, make uh, uh, arms producers, you know, so we produce a lot of, of, of military wear. But uh, we, we, with the Chinese, it's still a very rudimentary market for us. It's quite tiny. So in terms of them establishing bases, it's probably even probably far uh, uh, down the horizon. It's something that as, a South Af as South Africa, from a principal point of view, we've always been opposed to, opposed to uh, uh, having bases on our continent generally as a, as a matter of principle. That is part of our foreign policy agenda. And then I had uh, you, and then there was a question. So thank you, uh, Joni, for a very interesting uh, talk and lecture. So my name is Vori. I'm with uh, Africans in Boston. Um, uh, two questions. There are some who believe in a more regional uh, partnership and integration within Africa. I was listening to a member of parliament from Tunisia the other mm -hmm. day at Harvard, and uh, he was explaining how the, the way forward uh, from northern African countries to look towards sub-Saharan African uh, countries and how the Sahara Desert should become a link mm -hmm. <coughs> between Northern Africa and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, as well as the Middle East. So the first question is, how do you, um, what's your take on that kind of relationship or partnership? How would that impact the kind of relationship we're having with China and the US? And the second question is, moving beyond 2016, because you're saying sh China is gonna mm -hmm. overcome the US and become the the first economy. Uh, as China grow, eventually China's growth is going to slow down. How would that affect uh, the partnership that China is having then with you know, countries like South Africa? Mm, Thank yeah. you. Um, I think let's start with the question that uh, China's economy will surpass that of the US. That is just a prediction. That is focused. Uh, uh, I myself uh, uh, am not <coughs> that persuaded by that argument. I mean, there are still too many variables that, I mean, the U.S. economy is still by far the biggest there is in, in the world. It would still take quite some doing for, for the Chinese economy to, to surpass it in four years' time. Uh, but a lot can happen in four years. Uh, so focus are, are just that. When we speak of regional integration, if you look at the constitutive, constitutive act of the African Union itself, it speaks to African unity. We've been pursuing this since the days of orga the Organization for African Unity, that we've long recognized that a lot of the divisions that are currently happening in the continent, the instability, the conflicts, relate to the border issue, the borders that were arbitrarily drawn. And the only way uh, in which you can uh, overcome some of those challenges are actually to look towards a much more unified Africa, do away with the borders, but in a way that talks to socioeconomic development. We know we cannot overcome the issue of sovereignty overnight. That is going to be the biggest challenge for us. That is why you're starting from the regional economic community level of saying, as a country, we make sense probably because our economy is doing well, but as a country, we don't make sense in global terms. Because we're such a small country, you know, uh, we're just slightly larger than Texas with 50 million people, but you have an unemployment rate of about 25% in South Africa. So that is not such a big economy by global terms. We may be big in Africa, but not in the world. So if you start to look at the region, that is our region, SADC, you're starting to look at around 300, 370 million people. You are starting to look at a much more attractive market. So. Even then, you have economies with much more resources combined in the region. Already, the Maputo corridor, that is between South Africa and Zambia, uh, Mozambique, produces a lot of 
movement of goods and services across that. It's a huge economy on its own. So imagine if you just have infrastructure, you rehabilitate your ports, you have road networks and rail networks that can move goods and services, and we go towards the univisa, the visa that will allow our people to move freely across borders. Then you start eliminating the whole challenges of having to deal with border controls, of having to deal with illegal immigration and so on. But to do that, you need to create the necessary capacity in each country so that you don't have one-way traffic where people all move from one area of concentration to the area where there are more economic prospects. You will completely destroy the social network and infrastructure in those countries that are currently doing well. So that is the purpose of regional integration, to try and harmonize policies within regions, movements of goods, movement of people, that will start to make the regions make economic sense. And that will make, I mean, for now, all of you have heard probably the refrain or the example of, in order for you to travel in Africa, you have to go to Europe first and come back. Which, which is something that is really a serious problem for us because it makes, the, it, it makes doing business in Africa very difficult and costly. Where if, if you go to Europe, it will just be seamless. You can just travel by road, rail, and, and what, road, rail and, and so on. So those are some of the things that we're, we're looking at in terms of the regional economic communities. We've gone even a step further. In our, uh, the three regions, West Africa, East Africa, and Southern Africa, actually it's central, have now come up with a tripartite alliance where they are working together to try and harmonize policies and infrastructure within those three regions to be able to facilitate trade much more quicker. And those are the regions that are relatively doing quite well in terms of the targets that we've set to first reach a, 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 a customs union, monetary union, and ultimately political unity. So those are, 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 are the issues that we're looking at. You, you had a second question, by the way. What, what was that you talked about? So uh, the second question was uh, regarding China. I think you oh, yes. It. I was just going to make a quick comment yes. about, because you said earlier that East Africa uh, is one of the fastest growing uh, region in Africa. Mm. The uh, uh, Kenyan ambassador uh, to the U.S. came here the other day, yeah. and uh, he mentioned how they're, they're, they're doing an amazing work uh, in the region by developing infrastructure from <laughs> Kenya, the port of Mombasa, yes. through, through Ethiopia, all the way to South Sudan. And it's in line with what you were saying earlier, because you were saying that uh, you know, we need infrastructure and you know, we, the borders, we need to go beyond the borders. I'm even hearing that there's such a thing as a East African ID yeah. for you know, population to move around easily. So maybe you could comment on that a little bit. Do you yeah. see that as a model that could in, be? In fact, you know, um, uh, uh, that's actually the main reason why East Africa is going so quick. It's around the port of Mombasa. Uh, we are probably victims of our own success in the south because our ports are so congested, it slowed trade down because it now takes longer to move because those are the most viable ports. So as a result of traffic log jams, you are starting to slow down the, the rate at which you can move business. Hence, a lot of uh, 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 exporters are moving to the port of Mombasa. That is why you are starting to get, which is a good thing for us, really. You need to get business going in the continent. We do not have any intention of you know, hogging all the opportunities, but the more countries can be feasible and viable to run businesses on, uh, or, or to facilitate businesses on their own, then it's, it can only be good for Africa. You know? uh, because if you're starting to look at a, a, a population of over a billion people, most of it very youthful, how are you going to deal with the piracy issues in, in the Horn of Africa? Those are very youthful people who are not gainfully employed. So you need to start actually absorbing and creating the capacity uh, in the economies to absorb those youths to be able to get jobs. And it happens all everywhere in the world. You see it even here in the US. If you do not have prospects, you will react in manners that destabilize the country further. So that's, that's par particularly around those very areas. The financial services sector also is starting to pick up in, 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 in Kenya in particular. That is also facilitating uh, trade far much more faster because it's easy to do business where you have good banks, good stock exchanges, and so on. This is what makes the business of the world run today. I had you, yeah. So much, Mr. Molito. Um, my question uh, is: I'm uh, Stephen Barbaj. I'm a, a PhD economics uh, candidate at a BU. Um, my question is about linguistic, linguistic and expatriate social integration. So, 
I mean, I know there are some um, communities of, I think, mostly Nigerians in like Shaman City or, and, and, um, and you have some like garment, like textile mills in, in South Africa. But, um, you know, just uh, maybe some comments, um, your sense of, you know, how interested are our students in, in South Africa or elsewhere in, in learning Chinese? Um, is it growing? Um, and, um, and how many Chinese sort of uh, businesses, at least 170 businesses, um, are they sticking around a long time? Or are they, are they, how are they doing with the population? OK. Um, I can speak for the case of South Africa as, as an example. Um, in, uh, we've had uh, Chinese in South Africa since 1902 when they first came as indentured labor, uh, la laborers on the sugar plantations, they've stuck around. Uh, uh, some of the biggest property developers uh, are, are of Chinese uh, origin in, in Pretoria, in the wealthiest parts of Pretoria, MNT, which is amongst the biggest there is. Uh, so, so we have a, a, a longer track record of, of, of those businesses staying in, in, in the country. But most of them, if you look at the, the probably first, second, and third generation of those businesses, would be mostly of Taiwanese origin. Uh, but you know, as I said to you, it's the, 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 the groupings themselves that you have in South Africa tend to be very regional. You have uh, Chinese that group themselves according to regions, like any other diaspora does. You have the Shanghai group, you have the <coughs> Jilin group, and, and so on. So they, they tend to live uh, in, in, in those type of groups. So in terms of uh, the interest to learn uh, a foreign language, in my department, the foreign service where we are, we are all compared, it's compulsory for all of us to learn French because that we are all required to do service in Africa. And France, uh, French is actually a very predominant language. So that is the first step. So if it's in my department, it's a government policy that we have to pursue. In, uh, while I was at the Chinese, I was the head of the Chinese desk, uh, three of four of my staff went and did Chinese. Uh, one is actually now doing his master's, I think. Both of them have been posted to Beijing, uh, three have been posted to Beijing and one in Taiwan. And they speak fluent Mandarin. So now they are learning. It takes you about six years to be able to learn and speak fluent Chinese. So we've invested at least in each of them about three years. Then we decided to post them to China, which is four years. They're continuing now with advanced Chinese. So by the time they come back, they would have had seven years of Chinese. And we have now gone into a partnership with the University of South Africa. We've employed a Mandarin teacher. And it's something we offer to our cadets now into, as we bring them into the foreign service pipeline. So there is a growing understanding that uh, we need to learn languages. When we're doing the Burundi peace negotiations, one of the key requirements or uh, uh, um, languages that we needed was French, uh, which we sourced mainly from East Africa. Uh, Kenya, in particular, had a lot of translators because of all your UN agencies that are there. And it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money that you pay for those services. So it's a field that is growing, even though uh, the strangest thing about it is that we know that this is a field that we should be cultivating even more. But most uh, language departments in universities, sadly, are dying in South Africa. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the notion of speaking a, a second language is very important for us now, and we're investing quite heavily in it. Uh, my name is, is Rudy Yaksik from Concord Capital. Uh, I'd like to go back to the first question, the competition between perhaps South Africa and China, and broaden it to Africa versus China you know, granted, it's, there's a lot of um, differences, but that, and that, the point is, can you link your notion of China having basically a one-off transactional orientation, perhaps originally, perhaps even still, particularly in infrastructure, natural resources, extracting, and basically that's it, you having more of a long-term view because it's your backyard. Um, do you see China getting a more sophisticated um, more repetitive transaction orientation, particularly with the fund that you mentioned, mm -hmm. and establishing value change to service the growing middle class, but then having a more sophisticated form of control by the way that they control that value chain and don't let, for example, the SMEs that are in the chain upgrade skills and products. Thank you. Okay. 
No thanks. Um, you 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 know I don't know of uh, how many of you have heard of the farms race, the farms race, yeah, where there's been a concerted drive by uh, uh, the Chinese government to procure a lot of farms in Africa, to deal with food sh food yeah food sh shortages in China, and uh, of course that entails you farming the land much more uh, sustainably and whatever you if you want to be there for an extended period of time. And, and, and that is something that has become very concerning to, to the continent generally, that you cannot start uh, alienating huge portions of land that is supposed to first and foremost feed Africans before you, 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 you export that food. So that is something that is on the radar screen in terms of how you maintain control of that, of making sure that you can have Chinese capacity and Chinese resources assisting you. Because there's a lot of land that is lying fallow, that is not being used in Africa, arable land. But you need the resources to be able to farm that land. So there has been a concerted effort to use the resources that you get from there to, uh, to create the capacity to farm first and foremost in Africa and be able to develop the necessary value chains and be able to then you know, uh, export the food that you can uh, uh, in modest quantities obviously to China and elsewhere. But the priority is for, to make sure that the land that is in Africa benefits Africans first and foremost. And you need to, as I said, the biggest challenge that you have is the capacity side constraints where it's very easy to actually just alienate land and get the money for it as a once-off transaction and leave it to be managed uh, uh, in other hands who then probably sell the food back to you, which is the biggest problem. But the other problem that you have actually that is caused by some of your own uh, philanthropic organization is food dumping that depresses our markets in terms of food. Because you guys buy huge quantities of food here so that your farmers can make money. You have no markets for them, they are overpriced. Then you take that food and give it as aid in our regions. Mm -hmm. And once it gets there, it depresses our markets. So we're not able to make money. That's why it's easier probably to export that food in the, in the second place instead of giving it to the domestic population who probably won't be able to afford it. Mm -hmm. Yes, right the back, sir. Hi, how are you doing? Uh, good my evening. name is Gaden M with uh, Global Enterprise Service Corporation. I missed uh, a good deal of the talk, so I, uh, my apologies if uh, this question is a little bit redundant. Now, as the uh, Chinese-South uh, Africa relationship has evolved, I was wondering if there have been opportunities for reciprocal trade for South African firms in uh, China's huge market, and, and what, whether this is part of kind of your strategic um, orientation when entering into some of these discussions, I'd, I'd just be mm. interested if you could speak to that for a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have some of our substantial companies uh, in a variety of fields invested in China. Um, in fact, at some point, until the Standard Bank deal in 2007, uh, South Africa was uh, more invested in China than China in South Africa. Uh, we had our banks there, press, and what have you. Uh, and, and, and we did quite brisk business here, although it's a very tough environment uh, to do business in because there are always uh, IP issues. For us, a lot of the companies that have been there, particularly like uh, Sasol, which I believe is now on the ground, uh, doing their, is it coal, coal to liquid uh, plant there, uh, because there are always IP issues that we are concerned about, that uh, the Chinese will definitely buy stuff from you and what have you, but then who retains the IP for, for, for that? So when you talk of reciprocal, uh, the idea is always to get your technology and you know, and, uh, then get rid of, 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 of the partnership. So that is a concern that re remains. But so far, our trade has grown so exponentially, and we've done, and it's always in, uh, it, it's growing exponentially in the sense that we are seeing it both quantitatively in money terms, but also in terms of the value of what we are selling now to China. We're no longer just selling raw uh, commodities uh, to, to to the Chinese market. The problem with uh, us being able to sell even more value-added products is the fact that, as I indicated to you, our mining industry for the longest time has been dominant and doing very well. Uh, it's very renowned in the world in terms of its capability to produce gold, platinum, whatever the case may be. The challenge for them is creating the necessary value chains to say that don't just export your gold. Can you convert it to jewelry and what have you? But they'll tell you, but we're miners. We're not jewelers. 
let the guys who make jewelry come buy the gold from us. We'll sell it to them, definitely, and make their own gold. So to create those value chains, then you start to deal with capacity constraints. Mm -hmm. Do we have enough people who are diamond cutters and polishers? Probably they're all in Antwerp where we sell our diamonds. Mm -hmm. Do you have enough? So, so those are the things then that uh, you come short once you start uh, trying to address those issues of downstream industries that come from primary goods. Are you able to leverage on what you have to be able to uh, sell more value? But certainly in terms of uh, other areas, military where, as I said to you, even technology transfer, we're doing quite well. The trade, I mean, when, uh, when we started in 1998 with, with China, probably our trade was less than a billion dollars, far, far low. But I tell you, today, today we're probably approaching the 200 billion mark. So that's, it shows you how far it's grown. Last year, our vice president went to China in November. They signed about uh, five major contracts again, and the Chinese have committed to also working with us on our square kilometer array. So there's been a lot of positive developments in terms of how uh, uh, trade has been growing and how the partnerships have been growing between the two countries. And I would suppose it has applied to other countries as well. You see, the thing is, uh, 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 well, a lot of people will question the quality of some of the projects that you get, is that th with the Chinese, it's wh what they deliver is visible. You see, it, there's no tentativeness about it. But I'm still encouraged about uh, the attitude of some of the US businesses that we meet and, and, and US chambers that we meet and what have you, that once they go to South Africa and they see what is on the ground, and not just in South Africa, in other countries as well, when they see the opportunities and what it is they can, they can benefit, then you know, they start uh, 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 to get a sense that what is it that makes this partnership works. What we have encouraged some of our people coming here to seek investment, because that also counts a lot, is having costed or properly scoped projects. Because a lot of it also has to do with the initial investment that you want to, 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 to make. So you have to understand markets. Your market is a very difficult and sophisticated one. Because people don't want to engage you on the basis of saying, oh, well, this is still exploratory and what have you. They want an almost ready-made product. Whereas the Chinese are prepared to invest the time and talk you through the issues. With you guys, you want to say, well, here's an investment project. It's going to cost you $20,000. Uh, You're going to have so many staff employed. And these are the returns, projected returns. So you have to tailor make the type of engagement for each and every market. So your market requires that type of service. The Chinese one is much more open to you know, give and take. So you can engage in those type of processes. Uh, my apologies to those of you who have additional questions. Um, but um, as Ronald Reagan would say, uh, I paid for this microphone, so I get to lastly ask the last <laughs> question. <laughs> um, I loved your comment about building relationships, and then the transactions follow. And in that connection, uh, tomorrow uh, you and I are going to be visiting with uh, Paul Guzzi in Boston, yes, who is yes. the chairman of the uh, Chamber of Commerce here. Mm -hmm. uh, can you crystallize your comments here tonight and give us an idea of what your message will be when you meet uh, Mr. Guzzi tomorrow? Let's, let me take him to South Africa in April. Okay. <laughs> let me take him to South Africa in April, then you will see firsthand uh, what, 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 what are some of the opportunities that are there. This year, uh, we're, we're planning a number of great things. Uh, as you will recall, I said we, start, we signed our strategic dialogue uh, with uh, Secretary Clinton in 2010. Uh, she had been to South Africa in 2009. She's going back this year. But this year, which demonstrates, you know, you, you work at these things. It takes a bit of time. This year, she's taking with her a group of chief executives. So in, alongside the political work that she'll be doing with her counterpart, you'll have a business forum. And already we have a delegation from the U.S. Chamber that's going to South Africa in uh, next week, actually. Uh, and they, they were just there in, in, in February. They were blown away about the opportunities that are there. Mm -hmm. So the more people that you can expose and, and, and they can work through us at the embassy to be able for us to guide them who to see and what it is that they can get as outcomes from such engagements, the better. So we are hoping that with these relationships we'll start to see, you know, the U.S. involvement start to increase. For us, we are not in such bad shape in terms of the trade that we do with the U.S. and in terms of the investment that we get from the U.S. Uh, we, 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 we just got uh, uh, the Ford motor plant extended in South Africa. You know, the U.S. have uh, made a recommitment in 2009. So we, we're doing quite uh, reasonably well. 
So there's still a, a, a room for growth, though. Great. Yeah. Great. Johnny, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you very Great. much. Sure. Um, I'm incredibly inspired uh, by Johnny Maloto's remarks, so inspired uh, th that um, this weekend I have decided that I'm going to go out and I'm either going to buy a, a C-Class Mercedes-Benz or, uh, or a bottle of South African wine. <clears throat> so I think I'll be raising a glass of uh, Chardonnay to, <laughs> to Johnny Maloto. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to also thank uh, some of our partners. You, you met Tim Longman from the African Studies Center. Uh, the Pardee Center for the Study of the Long, Train, Long Range Future is here, represented by uh, Verity Norman. Our other co-sponsors are the Center, Center for the Study of Asia and the Global Development Policy Program. Have I left anybody Verity, else? Verity's the African Presidential Center. African Presidential Center, I'm sorry. Um, and I would also, a special thanks to Matara Diouf, who is a, a graduate uh, student here, who is instrumental in getting uh, Johnny here. Um, he's also been instrumental in a special guest, uh, another special guest that we have coming in just two weeks on April 13th. Um, the uh, entire continent of Africa has to be proud that the newly installed uh, chief prosecutor at the International Court, International Criminal Court, uh, Fatah uh, Bensouda, is going to be here on April 13th, and I'll extend a special invitation to all of you to join us for that event. Uh, as we know, there are some uh, very wonderful things going on that jo Johnny uh, Maloto mentioned in his talk uh, on the continent. There are also some horrific things going on on the continent, and uh, Fatou uh, Bensouda it will be her responsibility to prosecute some of those uh, bad actors and bring them to justice. So I hope you will join us on, on, uh, on April 13th. Um, Matar, thank you for your intercession. Thank you to all of our co-hosts. And thank you to you for your attention. And I have to tell you that I am humbled by the sophistication of, of your questions. Uh, it, was, it was very informed and uh, informing. So thank you very much. Thank you.